there was a battle between Jay Z and LL Cool J. Yeah, that was early on. I wasn't there for that neither. I think I believe it was in front of the Palladium. Um, okay. In, in New York on 14th Street, but yeah, that was a, a legendary moment. I wasn't I wasn't there for that, but I, I you know I heard about it. Yeah. You weren't there, but was this during the Rockefeller days or early on? Uh, the prequel. So that was uh, before Rockefeller. Okay. So, so him rhyming that with, with Big L was pre-Rockefeller and even the battle with DMX. I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is by that time, Cool J was a superstar. Yeah, 100%. So, so why, why is he battling an up-and-coming dude? I think Jay called him out. Mm. So from what I know of, Jay called him out once he came. Um, they both came out of the club and Jay called. I mean, Jay, was, Jay wanted to battle anybody then. He was, you know, really trying to, trying to make a name. Right, well, it makes sense why Jay would want to do it. Mm -hmm. But LL. Yeah, because I think, I believe Jay called him out and started rapping. So it was already like too late. He already, <laughs> he already drew him in. Uh, damn, too bad there's no uh, video phones back then. Imagine yeah. that, that battle on... Uh on video. Yeah, Clark Kent was there. I know that. Okay, I'm gonna ask him about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Clark. Okay. Um, so, you ended up selling, you know, Rockefeller and everything, you know, the, the three of you guys sort of went your separate ways. You ended up, you know, doing uh, Dame Dash Music Group and so forth. And then you got, you had that, that marijuana bust. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting because now you can legally grow marijuana where I am right now in, in California mm -hmm. and in a lot of different states. New York is, I think it's just medical marijuana? I believe so. Okay. So, I mean, number one, why were you growing marijuana at the time? Um, I actually wasn't growing marijuana. Aha. Okay. Yeah. So what happened was I, it was a conspiracy because I connected somebody from New York to a farmer in uh, California. I was actually buying dispensaries. And I was going to buy, I was looking to purchase some of these farmers' houses as well to sell to the dispensaries, thinking I'm building a vertical business. But in that time, it takes three, six, or nine months to get up and running. So a friend of mine asked me to connect them with somebody. And because they connected, even though they didn't do a deal, they spoke about it on the phone. That's a conspiracy. And I conspired because I connected them. So you connected a friend or someone you knew Mm -hmm. To buy a grow house in, in yeah they California yeah they was they was gonna do whatever you, you know I, I connected them I was like look this is him this is him it's all good you know you guys kind of take it from there that's a conspiracy okay and his phone was being tapped exactly okay so you're not even involved in none of this shit this is just no so what happened is because uh, I had a felony already. Um, I was facing 10 years just being attached to that case. So uh, I'm the one with probably the most notoriety because I'm the only one doing anything. I wouldn't say the only one. It was like 60 something people arrested. I'm not sure of everybody, but I was, you know, probably the main focus of doing something legal. So when um, everything happened, I'm on the front page of the po post. I'm on the front page of um, MTV, blogs, CNN, and everything else. So they use me to bring notoriety to the case. And um, because there was something called a, a mandatory minimum triggered at 100 uh, kilos, they attribute what they think you did a part of the case. So if I connect you and I say, Vlad, here's my friend, the farmer, right, Jake the farmer, and you say, okay, yo, I want to buy 100 kilos from him, right, which is what, roughly 220 pounds, that's a conspiracy right there. Whether that happens okay. or not, you conspired to do it, and I helped connect you guys. Okay, so you got hemmed up with 60-something people. Yeah. And this was all, they're all doing marijuana shit, essentially? Or That's what the shit? case was, yeah. Okay. So, so here you are, a multimillionaire mm -hmm. with one of the biggest brands in music. <laughs> Clothing, mm -hmm. liquor, yeah. artists who are still prominent today. 
and now you're sitting here looking at this stupid ass situation. <laughs> yeah. Going like, I mean, and, I, and your lawyer, lawyer's telling you he's not going to be able to fully get you out of it. Um, no, he was trying. And then, um, you know, like I took a lie detector test that showed that I had um, like nothing to do with anything that they were talking about. But it's up to their, um, it's up to them whether they want to use it or not. So even the guy who took the lie detector test was an extra, uh, um, an ex-federal agent that worked at Guantanamo Bay. So he was more than reputable. Uh, the DEA said that they wouldn't use that because anything, if they say it's 99.9 kilos, there's no mandatory minimum. And then the judge could say, okay, he could go on probation. So that hundred straddles the line. You know, why isn't it 99.9? Why isn't it a grant? Like, how do you know? And you, you guys don't have any of the stuff that you said that these guys conspired to do. So why would it be a hundred, you know? Okay. So for me, it was, uh, I, I, it came to a point where I could take five years, I can go to court, um, fight, and possibly get uh, 10 or 20 years, or I can tell. So I, I chose to take five years. Oh, so they said if you give us a bunch of other names, we'll make this go away. Yeah. And you refused. Yeah. Wow. Not a lot of people in your financial position would have done that. Um, yeah, probably, you know. So you end up having to go to jail for five years. You did the full five years? Yeah, well, you do, you know, from that, I did, yeah, about four. Okay. How, how did it feel to, to go from, you know, private jets and popping crystal to suddenly being in a, in a cage with men around? Um, I think you get, it doesn't matter what environment that you're in, you get used to it and you adapt, you know. So we're uh, creatures of habitat, right? So I got into something and I mean, I wasn't, um, it wasn't nothing that was foreign to me. I knew a lot of friends um, that did time before and things like that, um, you know, end up going in and knowing people in there as well. So, you, you know, you adapt. Okay. Like what was the hardest part about doing those four years? Uh, probably missing my family. So even when you make these decisions, legal or not, um, even though you may be straddling, straddling the line, right? Because at that time, California wasn't where it was today. You know, even though the, the law was, uh, it was r loosely written, um, and knowing that something could happen but not thinking about it, you're not thinking about the effect that it has on your family, friends, the community, and the people who really rely on you. So um, even though as a man, I'm thinking like, look, I can get through that. I, you know, I'm strong enough to do you know, most things or strong enough that most people, uh, you don't think about the effect that it has on them. So I guess you were born again when you were in prison? Yeah, uh, my last year. Okay, what triggered that? Uh, I had a uh, talk with a friend, one of my best friends, uh, actually Chip, and I wanted to talk to him about business and he chose to talk to me about the Lord. So we had this six hour conversation and that night things changed for me and I wanted to hear more about it. So we started to build a fellowship. We would sit down and talk about uh, scriptures in the Bible, what it meant to us and things like that. And um, I started to stray from being an atheist to um, becoming a Christian. Okay, I mean, were you raised Christian when you were younger? Uh, my mother was, yeah, but it wasn't something practiced in the household. It was probably practiced through uh, how she was living, but not how she wasn't teaching that to us, but showing it more through, an, through examples. Okay, so you became religious in your last year in prison, and then you got I out. Want, I want like, to say, uh, you know, that's a... It's another conversation. I don't know if we want to go there, but I wouldn't say it's a religious thing. I, I, I believed in God, right? I believed in Jesus, you know. Okay. What, what changed about your life when, that, when you made that transformation? Um, reflecting, you know, you start thinking about the past, uh, things that you could have did different, um, things, people you might have treated different, business decisions you might have made that was different. It's just, I think, um, a lot of reflection. 
Yeah, I mean, even, I, I interviewed... Uh, even with, with your family on how they was raised and things like that? Yeah, I mean, I interviewed Lecrae recently. Oh, know, really? One of the prominent uh, Christian. I, well, I heard about him during that last year of prison. Hmm. And because um, usually, you know, I, you, you get a lot of that, oh, I can rap or this and that, or even guys in prison, like, listening to stuff. But I didn't know he had the skill set that he had. He's, he's, yeah, he's a skilled rapper. Yeah, Lecrae's dope. Yeah. Lecrae, Lecrae is really dope. Yeah, so. And, you know, we had a, we had a real... A real deep conversation. Like mm-hmm. I'll send you some of those links if, if that that's okay. what interests you. You know what I mean? We talked about like, you know, for example, like like Tupac's thoughts about the black church. Mm-hmm. You know, and how how he felt it was it was, you know, it somewhat took advantage of certain communities. You talk about how one of your one of your heroes is Tupac. Yeah. Now now Tupac did speak against the black church. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there was a, like a Vibe interview, I think. That was kind of like a famous interview that he did. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of, I think hip-hop does that because hip-hop, because the black church really hasn't embraced or been present in hip-hop. You know what I'm saying? Like, hasn't really walked alongside of hip-hop. It's, it's kind of like chastised them from afar. I'm, I'm sure I'll meet him one day, but um, I'm definitely a fan of his.